Hello everyone, this is Raith Mustafa al -Abbasi, and I'm going to talk about chronic liver diseases in older children. Actually, this is a quick uh, overview regarding the topic. So as the name suggests, we're going to make a brief definition. We're going to list the causes, the common causes of chronic liver diseases in pediatrics. We're going to know how to investigate them, how to manage them properly, and then we're, and we're going to list some but not all of the complications presented uh, in chronic liver diseases in pediatrics. Well, this is a very common case presentation. We see an eight-year-old male who is an uncase of hepatitis B presented with jaundice, hepatosplenomegaly, and lethargy. And actually, this is a very common scenario in liver clinic. So this is a chronic disease because it's prolonged more than six months, and this is the definition. Uh, jaundice, hepatosplenomegaly, and lethargy, those stripes are very important in chronic liver disease. And you can see in this picture, this little poor uh, boy is reluctant to, to, to feeding. And this is because of loss of appetite in this chronic disease. And this hints about a very important issue, which is malnutrition. Malnutrition is a very important part of a chronic liver disease and should be considered uh, nutrients are very essential as, as a management for those in chronic liver disease. And we're going to talk about and discuss those uh, details later. Now, what are the causes? Well, actually, there are many causes for a chronic liver disease, and it differ according to the areas. I, I mean, in Europe, it's not the same um, in, 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 in order uh, as those in, in Asia or in different parts of the world. Uh, according to King's College London, the, the causes of liver diseases in children are divided into chronic, into acute, and into those with retransplantation. Uh, I mean, those with a new failure after a previous failure. In a chronic liver diseases, they got the most common causes, biliary atresia, alpha antitrypsin deficiency, non serotic metabolic liver disease, for example, galactosemia, and tumors such as hepatoblastoma, and others, for example, cystic fibrosis, uh, Wilson disease, polycystic liver disease, and others. Well, I'm not going to tell all of the details of those because each one needs a specific lecture for details, but biliary atresia, um, this is a congenital disease where there is an absence or um, an obstruction in the biliary tree. It got different types with different prognoses and surgery is the line of is the is the best is the only line of management to manage those obstruction or absence to reconstruct the biliary tree and we're going to, to talk about some details of the surgery next uh, we got uh, non serotic metabolic liver disease such as uh, galactosemia very important in our society to to mention hepatitis as the top of the list and um, also wilson disease is we we need to exclude wilson disease whenever we want to diagnose a chronic liver disease. Um, actually, Wilson disease I mean uh, there is a problem with cellulaplasmine, which is a protein that transfer kappa. So there will be an accumulation of kappa where in the liver and different organs, which lead to failure. We got polycystic liver disease, where cysts are built inside the liver. This is also congenital. And this will lead to intrahepatic failure. We got also um, cystic fibrosis, very common outside. Uh, I mean, in Western countries, in, in cystic fibrosis in the liver is the second most common cause for death in cystic fibrosis after pulmonary disease. Primary, there will be steatosis in cystic fibrosis, but this is not the cause of death. Actually, there will be fibrosis due to intrahepatic disease as well. Um, other causes are an acute and retransplantation. This is not the topic for today, so I'm going to skip it. Well, clinical presentations. Well, this infograph is very common, always is listed in lectures but many people try just to memorize them with just scanning those without understanding why they do occur. Um, some guy called William James, who's a philosopher, um, he told that, is life worth living? It all depends on the liver. Actually, this is a very, very deep quote. It means, and it insists and stress on the very important many functions of the liver. So once we understand those functions, we will understand their failure, and we will understand how do those will clinically present it. I mean, the very important three functions that the liver is conduct. The first one is the intoxication of blood. We all know this is number one. Number two, the synthesis of bile, which is the material that can uh, digest fat. 
Number three, play a role in coagulation as it synthesizes the protein needed for the pathway of coagulation. This is number one. And also vitamin K, which play a role in coagulation. So those two, three mechanisms and functions the liver work with, once they are impaired, they will clinically present it as signs and symptoms. So let's just start to correlate those with the function. Well, in cephalopathy, this is because of building up toxin, jaundice, failure of function, failure of conjugation, of bilirubin, epistaxis, bleeding because of a coagulation problem. We got cholestasis because of building up of bile and failure for drainage. So th this will lead to fat malabsorption, deficiency of fat-soluble vitamins, pruritus due to the buildup of bile. We, we got pills too because absence of bile in the enterosystemic uh, circulation, enterohepatic circulation. And we got dark urine because of also um, problem with the drainage of bile. We got ascites. This is because of uh, hypoalbuminemia, hypoproteinemia. So there will be a buildup of a fluid. We got hypotonia, peripheral neuropathy, and those related to the chronicity of the disease. Varices, because once there will be a problem within the blood vessel, within the liver, there will be a high blood pressure within the portal circulation. So the blood will be shunted where toward different parts of the circulation, I mean, toward the spleen. So this will lead to a hypersiplinism. This is hypersiplinism, splenomegaly with portal hypertension. And this is also goes with the same mechanism bruising and petechiae, coagulation problem. We've got spider nearby because of estrogen problem, because the destruction of estrogen is in the liver. We've got muscle wasting due to malnutrition, hepatorenal and pulmonary renal failure or syndromes. This is mainly because of a liver failure. This is a multi-organ failure syndrome because of failing one organ related to the second organ lead to multiple organ failure. Clubbing, liver palm, this is sure the same mechanism of chronic disease. Clubbing, this is not a specific to the liver, it, it goes with different diseases. Um, loss of fat store secondary to malnutrition. So yeah, they are the same. Once we, we correlate those with the function, we will never forget a single one of them. Now, how to investigate the liver? Well, actually, um, this topic is really misunderstood by many. Um, many people think that um, assessing the liver function is, sing is by a single investigation, which is the liver enzyme, or just checking for PT or albumin level. And actually, this is not a specific, uh, each one of them is not a specific tool to assess the, the hepatic function alone. To assess the function uh, completely, we need to check the scoring system. This is number one. And we need to do some dynamic liver tests. I'm not going to tell all of those details because this is a very huge topic, but I'm, I'm going to um, just uh, highlight the very important issues. In a scoring system, there are many scoring systems used to assess the liver. But the most commonly two used it is the child pug score and the MELD score. And each one of them um, it was, was invented for a purpose and a reason and is used in a specific patients. Uh, the dynamic liver test, um, well, those tests will, will examine the uptake and excretion mechanisms and function of the liver. The second part can can just investigate the uptake and metabolism of the liver. This is a second part, second function. And we're going to check for the volumetry and imaging for the liver. Well, those, very, th those tests are specific. We're not going to start with them. We will start with a simple panel, and then we will limit the scope of the diagnosis, and then we will start with a more invasive one, um, and we may also reach to the biopsy of the liver, and this to make the final diagnosis. Not always are essential, but it can uh, help us and guide us for the um, you know, the diagnosis. Now, let's just talk a little bit about child pug score. Actually, it was originally developed in 1973 to predict the mortality in patients with portal hypertension following uh, portal cable operations. Um, it was evolved to be a useful predictor of liver-related mortality in patients with cirrhosis. So it's not applicable in non-cirrhotic patients. Um, it's a quick assessment that can be performed easily preoperatively um, to, to prioritize patient for, for any, any intervention, for example. This is the surgeon who is expertise in portal hypertension called Charles Gardiner, who invented um, this nice scoring system. Well, it depends on those issues that I talked about. Level of bilirubin, level of albumin, PT, INR, encephalopathy, and the presence of the situs. So as I mentioned, single, single tool alone is not useful, but combining them together will, will be of sense. 
So it depends on the clinical and lab criteria. Let's talk about the lab first. So once you check for the bilirubin, if ETA is less than two, you give a score of one, two to three, you give a score of two, and more than three, you give a score of three. What the normal bilirubin is 0.1 to 1.2, this to be kept in mind. The albumin level, if it's more than three, if less than 3.5, you give a score of, uh, uh, more than 3.5, you give a score of one, 2.8 to 3.5, you give a score of two, and if it's less than, uh, 2.8, you give a score of 3, and normal albumin, you know, 3.5 to 5.5. We have a PT, normal PT is 12 to 13 seconds, so any prolongation of less than 4 seconds, it will be a score of 1, 4 to 6, a score of 2, and more than 6, a score of 3. So we calculate those scores. If we, if we get a 5 to 6 point, this is a class A. If we get 7 to 9 points, this is a class B. And if it's 10 to 15, this is a class C we get MELD score. Uh, originally, it was developed to predict mortality in patients with TIPS. I mean, um, transjugular uh, intrahepatic portosystemic shunt and prioritized patient uh, for recipient for transplant. It was evolved to be a useful predictor of the post-operative liver failure after hepatectomy for hepatocellular carcinoma. But actually, MELD is a little bit more complicated um, because it uses a more complicated formula um, we don't need to memorize it, but we need to understand that it depends on the serum bilirubin, INR, and serum creatinine. And this formula could be calculated online by different uh, 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 calculators for MELD score. MELD score, this is a model for end stage liver disease. It stands for that. Now, how to manage liver disease? Uh, basically, um, there is a medical management and there is a surgical management. Well, medical management goes with the three important parts. So either you're going to given nutrition. This is very important because as, as I said, they are malnourished. Um, secondly, you have to give vitamin, mainly vitamin K because uh, and fat soluble vitamin because the liver is unable, the liver is unable to produce them. So you, you need to support them. And third is, is a disease specific. So if it's a viral infection, you need to um, give antiviral. If it's an autoimmune disease, which is also a very common cause of liver disease in pediatric, you need to, to give immune suppressant agents, and, and so on. It depends on the cause. Um, but for chronic liver diseases, they will reach an, an end-stage liver disease in some but not all of the cases. And once they reach the, this end-stage liver disease, the only choice for them is the liver transplant, I mean the surgery. The surgical management uh, is a palliative surgery. For example, in those with biliary atresia, you go with cassi porto enterostomy. You go for liver transplant, and if they are already had their liver transplant and present with complication, for example, but cherry syndrome or hepatic artery thrombosis or chronic rejection, you have to do a re-transplant for those unlucky guys. Now, um, to be more um, detailed about the medical management, you see this, this poor guy with malnutrition, he got his nutrient by two lines. This is the nasogastric tube for nutrient, and this is um, his CV line where he gets his nutrient uh, through central venous line. For the surgical management, uh, you get this post cassia procedure mode on. Well, this poor guy got his uh, cassia procedure. This is, you can see the scar, and this is the scar of drain. A cassia por uh, portointerostomy or procedure is is a reconstruction of the uh, biliary tract. Well, this is my own graph, so I, I hope it will be, um, to be clear for you, this is the normal upper GI anatomy. This is not typical, but for demonstration purposes, I, I draw it like that. You can see this is the right and left hepatic duct. This is a cystic duct, the common hepatic duct, the common bile duct, and the common channel after the pancreatic duct into the duodenum. So if the disease is here, if the absence is here, whatever the type of uh, biliary atresia, we need to reconstruct that in order to allow bile to flow down and, and stop the obstruction and stop the cause. So this is the duodenum. This is the duodenum. We're going to, to make our own Y by cutting the duodenum here, making it up. We are going to resect this part completely, the gallbladder and the diseased part of the biliary tree. We're going to connect the rest of the biliary tract with the duodenum. This is the row and Y loop. And we're going to and this is the rest, go to the rest of the bowel, and we're going to connect what we cut proximally here to make our own Y. 
and this is the Kasai port tuberculosis. I mean, well, some patients um, will be happy with this procedure and the disease will end. Some will need a transplant later. So there is a criteria and indication for transplant in those with biliary atresia. Maybe next we can talk about them in, in a specific lecture. The other uh, definitive management is the liver transplant. Well, this is a very huge topic. Um, mainly in, in the lecture is just listed that a liver transplant and that's it. Uh, I'm not going to get into a lot of details, but I'm going to outline very important issues concerning pediatric liver transplant. Um, there are two options. So this is in general, either you go with a living donor and basically in children, this is very common and popular as they don't need that big amount of hepatocyte mass. Uh, and mostly the, the donor is a family member, so either father or mother, uh, or either you get an, uh, a, a deceased donor liver transplant, either from a heartbeat or non heartbeating donor. And this is a very huge topic as well. But mo most commonly in pediatric, they got their living donor liver transplant. And as I mentioned, from a family member. How, how much liver do we give them? Um, to answer this question, we need to uh, get a little bit into the surgical anatomy. Well, this is the segmental anatomy of the liver. Uh, this is a Cohenoid model. You, you see that the liver is further di uh, divided into segments. And those segments, uh, according to the blood supply, the venous, the arteria, and the venous, I mean the inflow and the outflow, as well as the biliary drainage for them. We have the, uh, the posterior one. This is segment one, the caudate lobe. You get segment two and three. Two and three, and this is the falciform ligament here. Two and three refer to the left lateral segments. This is segment four, four A and four B. This is the left lobe, segment two, three, and four. And this is Cantley's line. Well, Cantley's line is the uh, imaginary line. We we'll divide the liver into left and right lobe. We get segment five, six, seven, and eight with a clockwise uh, 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 distribution. This is the right lobe. This is the, uh, the uh, physiological right lobe, not the anatomical. So the graft type to be uh, given in, in transplant in children, um, so either we go with left lateral segment, I mean, we're going to give them 15 to 20% um, of the liver, and this is for infants or small children, or either we go with 30 to 40% of liver to be transplanted in them. This is in a small teenager, or even we go, go with the right lobe resection from a donor, giving them into the receiver. And this is in a large teenager and also in all, what's called in older children. And this depends on their needs. Actually, a human can live with a 25% of hepatocyte. That's why the maximum that we can go with is 60 to 70%. We leave 5% as a reserve. But in, in, in smaller children, I mean in infants and in small teenagers, they need uh, a little bit less than that. It depends on their body mass. It depends on area, body mass area. It depends on the body mass and area. It depends on uh, their, their disease, their extent of, of their livers. Some of them, for example, in acute liver failure, we're not talking about chronic disease, have part of their liver is functioning, so they go with split liver transplant. So all of those is a calculation, a pre-op preparation, very important. Um, you know, to, to make the uh, proper management line. Well, the patient selection for transplant, when not to advise for a transplant, this is uh, actually a topic of debate. Some, some for example, um, if their parents are, are neglecting their child and they are uh, not committed to give them immune suppressant agent for the rest of their lives, um, are not a good candidate for the transplant because they will lose this liver. So there is a, a matter of a priority. You have to do this surgery for those who will get usefulness from it. So you never do it for those who are not going to get a usefulness from it. For example, of those presented with, with a multi-system liver disease, uh, for example, and those presented with hepatoblastoma and uh, metastasis to different organs, they, those will not get a good advantage of doing this surgery. For those, uh, for example, with um, you know Down syndrome, for those with cerebral palsy, for example, if they got multiple diseases, this is a matter of debate, and it depends on the uh, uh, you know the board of uh, MDT who is going to uh, see the patients. Now, does it worth, 
there is a complication post transplant, but this is there is a good survival rate. And this survival rate was increasing over time from the first time the surgery was done by, by Tarzo. Um, and, and even this really make good survival rate after the introduction of immune suppressant in 1988. I mean, talking about azathioprine and um, later on the, the combination of azathioprine with prednisolone and other, other immune suppressant, a more specific cellular immunity suppressant. So the survival rate is really increasingly high. Um, and those children with end-stage liver disease who were about to die, their life really changed after the transplant, and, and they live a, a normal life even um, many, la uh, many years later. So yes, it worked. Now, talking about one of the complications, which is called the portal hypertension, what does that mean? It means that there will be a rise in the, in, the, in the pressure within the portal circulation due to a filled liver. Once the liver filled, the circulation inside will fill, and this will build a pressure inside the portal circulation. Normally, it's five to ten millimeter mercury. So any any pressure more than that will lead to a portal hypertension. And this will lead to, um, a, you know, shunting of blood toward the spleen, shunting of blood toward other collateral, and leads to presentation of caput medusa, esophageal varices, and other. Uh, actually, portal hypertension got different types. Either it's a pre-hepatic, hepatic and post-hepatic. Pre-hepatic means extra-hepatic. So either there will be a vein, a portal vein thrombosis, so either it's congenital, sepsis, or trauma. Or there was uh, an intrahepatic. Um, this goes either with the, uh, with the uh, sarcoidosis, kystosomiasis, or cirrhosis, nodular regenerative. Uh, hyperplasia or post hepatic goes with Pachiari syndrome, veno occlusive disease, and this um, could occur even post transplant as a complication. Secondly, um, could be a malignant occlusion, and this will also lead to a rise in pressure. So, the same story there will be uh, an occlusion in, in, in the circulation, and this will lead to a building up pressure, and this will lead to shunting of blood toward different parts of the circulation. Esophageal varices is one of the complications. So the blood will be shunted into those veins near the esophagus. And this will lead to a dilated vein, which could be presented in the endoscopic like that. Well, there is a classification, different classification for esophageal varices. Well, I'm going to list the, the simplest one. Um, so either we got a small varices, as in this picture. This varices is a single varices, occluding less than one third of the lumen of the esophagus, which could disappear on earth encephalation within the endoscope. Well, the second stage, different multiple esophageal varices separated by mucosa, do not disappear with air encephalation, and also they are less than one third of the, um, you know, the lumen of the esophagus. We've got stage three. Well, this is a huge, a large esophageal varices, uh, occluding more than one third of the lumen. There is another criteria for describing small from large to make it um, much more simpler. You depend on a cutoff of five millimeter. So if the vein diameter is more than five millimeter, it goes with large. If it's less than five, it goes with small. This picture here is a patient of high risk because this present with a nipple sign. Nipple sign means there is a hemorrhage spot on the vein, on the varices. So th those patients are of high risk. Now, how to manage this? Well, it depends on the on the stage, it depends on the patient. It can range from a medical treatment, you know, with with uh, ranitidine or with omeprazole, or it can go more with octreotide, or you can go with sclerotherapy and clipping. Well, this picture show endoscopic clipping. This vein was of, of high risk of getting, uh, you know, uh, uh, to bleed, so it was clipped. This is the procedure. Well, um, at last, the lecture reference was illustrated textbook of pediatrics. This is a very quick tutorial. This is a very quick uh, overview on chronic liver disease and how to assess liver disease, what are the causes, how to investigate. Well, each topic, uh, each cause need a, a, a detailed lecture to be covered as a whole, but this is an overview as mentioned. Well, I'm very happy to receive uh, any questions, either in comments or in direct message, so feel free um, to contact me. And uh, that's it. Thank you for listening. And before I end the uh, the, the lecture for today, um, you can see this picture is 
a memorized picture of the genus Tarzel, the first one who did the transplant. And this is with the, with the first survival child. Uh, it's in 1988 where azithioprine was invented. So this child received prednisone and azithioprine and he survived the transplant with no rejection. Thank you for listening and see you in different lecture and other tutorials.